So we're continuing to talk about theology proper, and one of the things that we come to, and this is this is probably one of the first stops along the way in the class where you, you start to get into what I would consider to be contentious issues, where people really have some polarizing views and uh, perspectives on certain things. And I, and I want to I want to try to approach this with charity because I know some of you all that will watch this will probably have some very strong opinions on this and, and conclusions. Um, but I want to try to be fair and I want to try to be honest about some things. And I also don't want to get bogged down into the um, to the minutia here. I think there are far better people than myself that can discuss the original creation of the world. And I think you can find that on YouTube and books, you can Amazon, Google, all of those things. Um, there's a myriad of positions. And what I want to do is I'd, I'd like to just sort of try to talk a little bit on a high line view of creation to what I feel like we probably need to know at least um, as Christians when it concerns uh, our theological enterprise. Um, but what I'm not going to do is get bogged down in all of the various positions because I think you can you can find those out. And what I found is is that if you already have a position and you're entrenched in that position, I'm probably not going to say very much that will change your mind. So therefore, it's not worth trying to get into all of the weeds with all of that. However, I do believe that whether you have a position, um, whatever it may be, that, that there are certain things that we as Christians sort of need to affirm and uh, those are going to be the things that I focus on the most. And then what I want to do is rather than getting into a bogged down discussion of creation, um, I want to talk about creation, but I also want to talk about the, the biblical story on how creation sort of unfolds that story. Because as we turn later on into Christology, we look at anthropology, all of those things really are informed by the biblical story of creation. So the creation story is hugely informative. Unfortunately, I think we oftentimes bog down in the particulars, but not. So here's what I would say. Traditionally speaking, there are several views that people hold when it comes to the creation of the world. Um, one of them, uh, and, and I think most Christians to some degree agree with this term, which is ex nihilo. Um, ex nihilo um, is out of nothing. Um, I think Christians believe um, and I'm sure there's some Christian theologians out there that do not believe this, um, but as a general rule, um, Christians believe that God did create the world, there was nothing here, and then God created the world. And how did that happen? W what, was, what was the original creation? And, and I think here's where you're going to find the, the areas that, that bog down. Um, the, the first real position and, and, I, and, and I don't, at this point in my life, I'm not sure if it, the, the percentage-wise of which ones are held by the most, but th these, these are the ones that you'll find Christians um, believe. The, the, the first one I would call the 24-hour um, literal view. This position um, is as old as Christianity. Um, it's a very popular position, especially um, in certain camps today. And, and the idea is that when we read Genesis and we read the original creation, that God has ordered that creation in Genesis 1 in six days and then a seventh day of rest or a Sabbath day. And this position would say that those days are 24-hour literal days. Now, the pros of that or as the text seems to indicate that. It seems to indicate that you're dealing with a day that has a morning and an evening. Actually, it, it, it does evening and morning first. I think there's a reason for that. Um, but uh, when you're looking at evening and morning and, it's, and you see a day, the average person that reads that, um, I think people who hold this view would say, it seems to be self-evident in the text that we're reading about six literal days. Um, I, I think that I think that that is a very um, favorable argument for someone who is holding to this view. Um, the, the, the text does seem, uh, specifically at the surface level, that we're dealing with a literal um, time frame. The, the negatives of this are is that when you adopt a literal 24-hour um, day, six-day creation with a seventh day of rest, um, you tend to then run into issues with the earth and its age. Now, I'm not a scientist, and, and, I, and, and I think there's good books that you can read 
um, on what I would consider to be a young earth um, understanding of creation. Um, and, and they're out there and, and you can avail yourself of those. And if you're one of those, then you already probably know your positions. If you don't and you wanna study it, please feel free to do that. Um, there's ample resources out there. But w- what I would say is, is that typically speaking, a, a young earth creationist, and you'll see this oftentimes um, referred to as YEC. So if you're reading a book or a theology book or um, a, a commentary and YEC comes up, that just means young earth creation. Um, typically, a young earth creationist believes that Genesis is a literal um, 24-hour, seven-day periods, and that would mean that the earth is probably somewhere around, let's, let's just um, round up to 10,000 years old. The, the complications obviously come in when science gets in the way and science says the world is old and they have their convincing arguments. One of the things that I have seen, and, and I think most people have seen this, is that when we do train our um, people that the earth is young and, and, and we train that into our students and into our kids, when they end up in school, they end up with a completely different worldview than a young earth and a lot of times they toss the whole Bible out. They're like, well, if the Bible's wrong at Genesis, then it's wrong on everything. I'm not here to convince you that you shouldn't be a young earth creationist or that you should, um, but that is a position. Um, I, personally, I'm not as persuaded by this particular um, stance, but that doesn't mean that I'm right and they're wrong. I think we need to have charity here. My concern, and, 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 I, and, I, and, I, and I know the pushback already, the pushback's gonna be, we shouldn't be interpreting the Bible based by science, based by whatever, and I completely agree. 100%. But it does seem, and I do think God gave us a mind and God gave us something to think through, it does appear to most people that the earth is not 10,000 years old. Now, again, there are books that will tell you how that becomes reality, how science is saying something's older, but it's really younger, and, and I'll let you work that out. However, this is what's important. I do not believe that whether you have a 24-hour literal view or whether you don't have a 24 literal hour view, that that means that you don't love God, that you're not trying to read the Bible right, that you're not trying to be fair to the text. Um, I think these are just complicated issues. I mean, you go all the way back to the early church, Augustine, um, he didn't believe that the earth was young. So you have have this um, real issue when it comes to biblical interpretation um, and, and theology. And as a systematic theologian, I am less worried about the particular parts of how someone views creation as, as much as I am concerned about the theology of creation, the fact that God did create. Like I agree with my 24-hour literal view, brother and sister, that God created. We both agree to that. We both agree that creation was special. Um, and, and these are things that I think from a theology standpoint that we need to really focus on. But I want to be fair. Um, I, I do think that there are some uh, strong arguments for, for this position. So I don't want anybody who holds this position to think I'm just being dismissive and that I don't appreciate where you're coming from. In fact, I have some really close friends in my life that, that hold this particular view. And uh, um, I, I think they're wonderful people and I think they love God and they're definitely um, scholars in their, in their own right. So th- that is one position that, that, that gets held is this 24 hour literal view. Now this next position, um, is not sort of popular at this particular point, although there are definitely segments of Christianity where you'll find this to be popular, Um, but it was far more popular um, in years gone by. And it's what we refer to as the gap theory of creation. And the gap theory basically says this, says that, hey, the, the world was created by God and the days are actually 24 hour literal days. But what's not being caught in the text is that there is a period between Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 1-2. When it says the world um, was without form and void, um, they try to interpret somebody who's a gap theorist would say that that should be that that the, the world or the earth became without form and void. In other words, God created the heavens and the earth, and then the earth became. It wasn't God created the heavens and the earth, Genesis 1, and the earth was without form and void, that they try to stress that that verb is became. And the idea then would be is between Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, 
you have an indefinite period of time. There, there's, there's no way to account for that gap theory. And most gap theorists believe that's where the rebellion of Satan and the, the angels happened and that there may have been you know, more things going on than we have any idea. Um, they can account for many other things that you find maybe in science or whatever. Um, I don't think that gap theorists are trying to accommodate science with their um, interpretation. I think they're trying to um, look at what they feel the text says. That they, they do not believe that God would have created something imperfect, that, that the world was without form and void, and they cannot account for how that world was without form and void, because how could God create something that wasn't perfect, that wasn't pure, so on and so forth. And so th that, that gap theory comes from, I think, trying to exonerate God in some ways, but it also helps in that fundamental framework of, of explaining possibly some of the things that science says about the age of the earth. Now, again, if you're a gap theory person, totally understand. I don't think the language of Genesis 2 um, unfortunately even remotely allows for an interpretation of became. Um, I, I think that's just not in the cards. Again, there's people that will push back on that. I don't see that, but again, I don't think that having a gap theory means that you're not a Christian or that you don't love God or, or, or any of those things, but it is, it is a framework in which people have um, tried to interpret the creation story. And I think the pros for the, the gap theory would be that um, it does potentially help explain, you know, when did the angels fall? When did Satan rebel? Um, how did certain things happen? Why was the earth so without form and void? Like, was, wasn't it originally created maybe good, and then it, it fell apart because of the, the fight in heaven? I think it also potentially helps, um, you know, especially the younger generation when they go to school. It doesn't lock them into a young earth creation, so to speak. Um, it'll, it allows for them to have a little bit of flexibility. Um, I think that the, the cons or the negatives of the, of the gap theory is that I just don't think the language allows for that type of interpretation. Um, and that's just, you know, that's, that's my obviously thoughts in studying Hebrew and looking at the language, um, but, but that would be my critique of it. Again, it is a view. Um, I, I don't know what the percentage of Christians that hold to it. I, I, would, see, I would think it'd probably be very small, um, but, but it is a particular view. So we have the 24 hour view. Um, we have the, um, the gap theory. The, the, the next one is what I would call, and, and, and this is what people have referred to, um, is a day age view. And the day age view um, focuses on the Hebrew word yom. Um, the, uh, the day, you know, like you think of Yom Kippur. Um, it, it, the, yom, yom is a, a, is a, a, a day. And, and the question is, what does that mean? Like, what does it mean? To, like the day of the Lord. Is that a day, like a 24 hour period? Or is that an indefinite time of, of time and space? And many people who in, interpret Genesis um, focus in on that word for day. And, and they say, we don't think that day necessitates a 24 hour um, seven day creation. We, we, we think that, it, that there may be what they would call a day age view, that, that the words there are looking more at an age so that you know you're not locked into a young Earth creation. You're, they would they would be you, you might see this as in your in your books at from time to time an OEC an old Earth creationist. Um, that there are people that would say that Genesis is not trying to give us a literal creation as much as it's trying to give us a creation account that is using a word that can have more of an expanse. And this is where this is where you start to take the turn in some ways on the creation account. Is God trying to give us, in Genesis 1 and 2, is he trying to give us a scientific account of creation? Because that's a, that's a great question. Is, is, is the Bible trying to do science or is it trying to do theology? And, and, and I think this is where the roads tend to, tend to separate. Um, if you're someone who says, no, the, the, the Bible is telling us how God created the earth as in science. In other words, 
the, the, the categories of the creation are exactly how he did it. These are, these are the days, whether, whether they're 24-hour days or whether they're ages, are they, are they days for saying this is the way God did it? And so if the scientific record doesn't agree with the Bible, then what we do is we, we, we would cancel out science. Science is wrong. We're going with the Bible. And all of that sounds great. I mean, you know, as Christians, we, oh yeah, we should go with the Bible, um, you know, before science. And I think that there's 100% truth there that what God has said is, is true. The question is, what has God said here? And so what you've got with the day age view is you've, you've got um, people who would say th the word day um, is, is not a, a, a day like we would think. It is an age. Therefore, Genesis 1 is not telling us that the earth is young and now we have to reinterpret science and, and go back and try to figure out why it looks like the earth is old and it's not really old. And, and why science is trying to you know mess us up and, and all of these things, the day age person would say we don't have to go there. Um, this is a long period of time. We don't know what the period of time was, and so it doesn't it doesn't really disagree with science. And you're going to find that even within the day age community, you're going to have the two roads of division. One of them is going to say no, science is bad, even though it's a day age view. This is this is the way the Lord created. Or you'll find people in the day age view that say, no, th there's nothing going on with science here at all. Which, which leads me to what I would consider to be another view here, but, but I think I, I want to take a little bit of an excursus here to just at least get us to think. Um, you do not have to adopt any of this, but I do think this is important. When we talk about um, science and we talk about scripture and, and we, we talk about is there any... any intersection between the two. And I think this is where we need to stop before I do this last particular um, view, is that, you know, is the Bible really trying to teach us science? Like, you know, does the Bible look at, is, is the cosmology of Scripture the same cosmology that you and me have? You know, uh, um, Richard Branson just blasted off into space, and there's pictures of him up in space. And when he looks down, you see the blue earth. It's a circle. It's got the you know the blue oceans and you know and the white clouds and you can see the land. That that's the world you and me know. We know the world. We we call it a blue earth cosmology. We just we know it because we've we've gone up into space and we've been able to take pictures of this world that we live in and and now we vividly have these pictures. The question would be in the ancient Near East. Was that the cosmology that they had? Um, the answer to that, I think we can say pretty certain, the answer is no. They did not see cosmology the way that we do. Um, I do think that if you're a literal 24-7 person, or you potentially are a day-age person, or even a gap theory person, you may say, that's true, the ancient Near East did have a different cosmology, but God wrote scripture and he gave us the right cosmology in Genesis 1. Um, that's probably... But it's potentially true, um, but but I think that as most things that we do in Scripture, we try to go back and ask what was the culture, um, what was the background, um, what was going on at the time, what were the perceptions of the people at the time, what type of language is being employed, um, what type of grammar is being employed, um, what what's being taught, and I think that for me, and and, and again, I'm not, I, I, this is this is not um, as a as a as a teacher. I'm surely never trying to indoctrinate somebody. I realize there are Christians that love God that have different opinions on this stuff. Um, but I do feel like that I need to at least, um, on this particular issue, because it's so heated, I feel like I need to give a little bit of thought as to where I think this is all headed and where I think that Genesis 1 is, is dealing with. But I do it with charity. I do it without any stones to throw. Um, but I, but I do it because I, f I feel like that this is maybe the best answer that we have right now for Genesis one. I'm convinced that Genesis is not dealing with science in the way you and me think of science. I, I can't imagine anybody in the ancient Near East thinking about some of the things that you and me think about here in 2021. Just 
not not going to happen, not going to be a reality. Uh, different worlds, different cultures, everything was different. And to try to read our time and our culture and our ways in which we do things into the biblical text um, is what we call anachronistic reading. You're, you're reading your own stuff, my own stuff, back into the text. I don't think that's wise. Um, so I'm not convinced that, again, not saying that Genesis doesn't have anything to say, but it's not the purpose of of Genesis 1. The purpose of Genesis 1 in, in, the, in the scripture is theology. That's, that's the purpose of Genesis 1. It, um, the Bible never claims to be a science book. It never claims to be, but it, it, it does have things. I mean, it talks about trees. It talks about animals. There are scientific things in scripture. Um, the Bible's not a, a history book, although it has history in it. And, and some of it's chronological and some of it's not. But that's not what the Bible really tells us that it is. Um, you know, Paul says it in, in Romans 15, 4. He says the things that were written before, which is the Old Testament, were written for our instruction. It, it, in other words, it's, it's written to equip. It's written for theological instruction, for, for help and growing in our relationship with God. I don't think you can make the case that the Bible is trying to be a scientific textbook in the sense of science that you would go to school or I would go to school to take as a, as a class. So therefore, when we come to Genesis 1, um, it's my suspicion that we're trying to make the Bible do something that the Bible never is trying to do in the first place. Um, I think a lot about that with the Gospels. Um, there's, there's things in the Gospels where people go, obviously, this is not true. Obviously, the Gospels are wrong because one Gospel says there's two angels and one Gospel says there's one angel. Well, that's, that's only an issue if we're reading the Bible in a particular way. It's not an issue if we're reading the Bible through a theological lens and we're able to start asking the questions, what's being said theologically? What's being said about God? Why are the writers recording certain things like this? What's going on? Totally different lens than if we're reading it like through biography or through um, nonfiction or through science. And so what I would like to suggest, and, and, and I think that this is um, biblically true, but I think it also is the best way to explain our creation story, is that the Bible and Scripture is a book about theology. It's a book about God. It's a book about God's interaction with people. It's telling us things about God that we wouldn't know. And it's also polemical in the sense that it's, it's pushing back against culture um, and ideas of its day. Um, you know, some of the stuff in the Old Testament, we go, what, why were they thinking that? Well, they're pushing back against things of their day that, that, that God's working with them in a particular moment that today we know more and other things have happened. And, and, and I think that it, it, we call that a principle of accommodation, that God accommodated certain people at certain times as he was helping them to understand who he was because that's the nature of God. He's gentle, he's kind, he's long-suffering. And so all of these things, when we come to Genesis 1, we come to the creation account, um, I think that we need to maybe pause for a moment and not get dug in on our particular way in which we view, view the creation narrative and maybe just pull back for a moment and ask, what is this really saying to me? What is this saying as a text theologically about God? And what would the original hearers, what would the original writer have even meant in the text? When we, we seem to want to do this in the New Testament. Like when we go to Corinthians and we talk about head coverings. Nobody goes, oh, that's literal. There are people that do. I, I need to, yes, there are people that say women should still wear head coverings because that's literally what the Bible says. Small group of Christians. Most Christians say, no, that was a cultural thing. And there's a reason why Paul did that. He was meeting them at their day, at that particular time, at that particular place. What's the larger applicational point from 1 Corinthians 11 so that we can apply it to our lives? That's typically the way we do Bible study. Almost all Protestants and Catholics, too, do Bible study that way. So we shouldn't change that formula when it comes to Genesis with an a priori assumption that, no, this is what Genesis has to be. It has to be my position. I would say, hold on, because if your position is wrong or if my position is wrong and we're dug in so much on that, we may actually be pushing people away from Jesus than bringing them to Jesus. So this is this is my thought on, on creation. Um, I am leaning heavily on many people that have gone before me. Um, you know, John Walton is someone that comes to mind. Um, Bruce Waltke is somebody that comes to mind. 
Um, th- there's a number of people that I would say, and I, and I don't agree with everything that Walton or Waltke um, have said. Um, you know, Trimper Longman has got some stuff on creation. Um, you know, there's a number of people that have written on this, and I, and I think that in reading some of their literature, um, it, it, it's, it has put a pause in me, at least, before I jump into the text to ask what's going on here and so on and so forth. And it's not just them, it's also my training of you know, reading literature, um, looking at stuff in, in, the, in the time that it was written. This is what I think we should be saying about creation, and, and, and I hope that this will, will help in some ways. Um, but like I said, if you already dug in on your position, you, you may just want to click on to the next part, and, but I hope you'll hear me out and listen to what I have to, to say. So when we think about creation, I think there are things that the biblical text tells us about creation that are what I would consider to be the sine qua non. Latin term that means the knot without which. In other words, you can't play basketball without a ball. That's the sine qua non of basketball. Can't play basketball without goals. Sine qua non of basketball. Got to have those things or it doesn't happen. I think the sine qua non of creation is that God created. I think once we once we go, well, there is a God, but he wasn't really involved. There was like, you know, whatever. Maybe he's out there somewhere in space, but he's not really involved in the creation. He wasn't really much a part of anything. I think that that's where you have to start going. Okay, that doesn't make any sense biblically. I mean, the Bible is very clear that God created. And I think that that is absolutely important. I think the next thing is, is that the world was a special creation. It wasn't, it wasn't an afterthought. It wasn't that some deistic God sort of wound the world up like a clock and then took off and now everything sort of runs, that, that there is a special creation here, that, that the world, the way it was created, the way it was formed, the fact that God breathed into man life that there is a specialness to this, not random, not um, just happened. Um, we just got here because of some stuff sort of all worked together and all a bunch of globs of stuff. And eventually this is where we ended up that I don't think that scripture allows for that. I think scripture is very clear that God created and that we are a special creation. However, I think the creation narrative which we find in Genesis 1 and in Genesis 2, um, I, I think are, are giving meat to these bones theologically more than they're trying to give us something to argue about, did this come before this? And, you know, that, you know, since day four is where the luminaries are created, that means in day one, when God said, let there be light, the reason that it, it looks like the light is so old is because... God created the luminaries on day four, which gives the misperception when we're looking at science that the, the, the light is hundreds of thousands of years old or hundreds of millions of years old. It isn't because the light was already here and then God created. I think, I think that that's just, I think you're trying to force something into the text um, that, that's not there. I don't think God created the world problematic for us to, I mean, Psalm 19 says that the heavens declare the glory of the Lord. I don't think that the Lord made the world in such a way that every person who's studying the world is going to come to all the wrong conclusions because they didn't know how to read Genesis 1 um, right. I, I think that's I think that's a stretch. But I do think Genesis 1 is giving us a theological understanding of God's creation and his special creation. And let me, let me sort of tease that out a little bit as to um, what I see in the creation story proper. Um, first of all, I do believe that the world, when when it is created, um, it does not have form. So we'll call that no form. And it's void. Um, I don't think that that's by accident. I don't I don't think that those those Hebrew words that are there, um, you know, tohu and bohu. Um, without form and, um, and and void, I don't think that those Hebrew words um, just are accidentally there or because there was a gap um, or, or anything. I think it's there because I think creation is teaching us things about God and how he creates and how it's a special creation. I think that 
what God does is he takes something that has no form and is void, and what he does, he creates something that's good. That is a theological truth in the creation story. And, and I think that's something we can hold on to rather than arguing about, you know, all the other things that we argue about, carbon dating and, and, and all of these things and, and things that I don't think anybody can win that argument. I do think, though, that when we go to the creation story, there are certain things that are just simply there for the taking. And, and the first one is, is this idea that God takes things that don't have shape, that, that don't have, that are, that are chaotic, so to speak, and he forms them, or as, as the writer says, he creates something good, which I think begs the question when we talk about creation, are we talking about something um, that is ontological? Or are we talking about something that is functional? And I think these are these are some good questions to ask and categories to think about. Is, is God creating um, the world ontologically in the Genesis narrative? Or is God creating in a functional way the, the world in Genesis 1? Um, I don't think anybody, the Christian, disagrees that ontologically God created the world at some point. Ex nihilo. He created out of nothing. I think even science is leaning that way now with the Big Bang. That there was nothing. There was something. Um, I think the writer of Hebrews in chapter 11 says that God created what was here out of nothing. I think, I think creation ex nihilo is taught in Scripture. So there is a sense in which the world was created. It, this word create is an ontological creation. The question is when we read Genesis 1, are we reading an ontological creation or are we reading a functional creation? And what I mean by that is, is did God take this and did he create, put together, order good by creating function? And, and I think that that might be the theological thing that's going, because this is, this is the pattern of salvation. I mean, Paul talks about um, our, our salvation being like the pattern of uh, creation, where the light shone into the darkness. I mean, he uses that in the Corinthian correspondence. So in Paul's mind, creation has a very salvific um, motif to it. This is how God works. God takes things that don't have function. God takes things that are not, not able to have life. The world's covered with briny water and there's, there's no... There's no life. I mean, it's, you know, in, in, it's almost chaotic and it's dark and there's no form and there's void. He shines light, he speaks, and all of a sudden good comes out. I think that Genesis is talking a lot about the way God works in everybody's life, especially in ours, and specifically in terms of salvation. And there's a lot of creation going on here that is functional. And I think that when we read Genesis 1, what we're going to see is that there are, the days are staggered. You have one, two, three, and then you have four, five, and six. And I think these days are written in a way that parallel each other. Um, so on day one, you have light. Um, God says, let there be light. There was darkness. So we've moved from darkness, a chaotic state, to now where we have light. That this is starting to order the world. That, that there's a there's an orderliness going on here. That, 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 that God is taking something that doesn't have order and he's shaping it with order. And I think that's when we look at our own lives, that's what God does. That's what God he's going to do. He's going to take the world and he's going to make it to what he wants it to be. There's this sense that God is creator in the sense that he, yes, creates ontologically, but he's creating functionally. And I think that we see this all through scripture. So day one, where he creates light, on day four, he creates the luminaries, which are the, 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 the objects that, that give light. So what, what you have here is you have the function, which light and day would be time, and then you have the functionaries that, that order, that create 
that function. And, and I think there's a parallelism going on here in Genesis that, that's way beyond science, that's way beyond Branson going up into space, way beyond, you know, how does the archaeological record lay out. And I think all of those things are great to study, but they're not necessary for theology because I don't think the Bible's trying to teach that to you and me. I think it's trying to teach stuff about God. And I think once we get past all these arguments of positions, I think what we do is we start to fall into understanding that I don't need to fall into a position. I, I, need, I need to realize that Genesis is telling me something about God, and we can all agree on what Genesis is talking about. And, and on day two, you have the, the sky and the water are, are, are divided, um, which creates what I would call livable space. Like before, there was just water. And now there's a separation of the waters. And in Genesis um, 1, the idea is that there's water on the earth and then there's a canopy above. You know, and of course, in the ancient Near East, it makes sense, doesn't it? That you look up, the sky's blue, and every once in a while it rains. So in their mind, there was water above, that God had taken the water below and he had separated it and he created this area here um, for for, for, for space. And what you do then is then you have the fish and birds that are here and they fill up this. So once again, you, you, you're, you're paralleling the, the, the things that God is ordering and then he's placing the things that go within that. And of course, on day three, you have the uh, dry land that comes forth from the water and of course, that then allows for um, the, the creatures, plants, and all of those great things. And I think what's going on here in Genesis is that we're seeing a functional creation. Now, does it take away from the fact that God created ontologically? I believe that 100%. Creation was ex nihilo. God created something out of nothing. Totally understand it. But I don't think that Genesis 1 is trying to make that point as much as Genesis 1 is trying to make the point that God ordered the world. And I think this idea of ordering the world is why God can, on day seven, he can rest. Um, what does that mean to rest? I don't think that means to take a nap. I don't believe that means to um, lay down. Rest in the Bible is the absence of chaos. In other words, because God has so ordered the world, now he can rest, which means get about business. In other words, now, 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 now we can get things going because we're not patching things up. And I think that that's the way God wants to work in our lives as Christians. God wants to bring order into your and my life. He wants to he wants to shape up our marriages, our temperaments, our finances, our all those things. And what he wants to do is he wants to bring us rest because you know as well as I do that. Um, chaos in our lives keeps us from really doing the things that God wants us to do. When, when there's chaos, we're not thinking about praying. When, when there's chaos, we're not, well, I mean, we may say a prayer to get out of the chaos, but we're not thinking about really digging in and, and, and understanding God until, until there's rest. And I think that that's even why in the Ten Commandments, the first three are about loving God, the last six are about the way we treat our neighbor, but what's sandwiched in the middle? Rest. That if we're not at rest, we're not going to love God and love people the way God would want us to. So I think the imagery here is, is incredibly powerful. And I think that the arguments actually sidetrack the, the beauty of what's going on here in creation. And so knowing that, I think what we should do now is let's, let's turn towards sort of the how this applies and how this speaks to the larger biblical narrative um, as, as we continue to work ourselves through creation and sort of the original condition. Hey, Chip here. I just want to take a moment and say thanks so much for, for watching Reaching the Next Generation. Um, I really hope that this was something that was beneficial to you. And what I would ask, if you really enjoyed this, would you like it? Would you subscribe to it? Would you give us some comments? And most importantly, would you share it? Um, I believe with all of my heart that the material and the content that we have on this channel truly can make a difference and resource pastors and leaders and Christians. And you can help us to truly help others to reach the next generation. Thanks so much for being a part of our channel.